Mickey Waves, episode 117. That's 117, 117. And we're fortunate enough to have uh, from Hastings, England, uh, Jack from Kid Capisci. Jack, thank you for joining us on this Making Waves. This is an afternoon edition, so pretty cool. Thank, thank you so much for having us. I feel like um, the, the looking across this Zoom call, it's looking like there's still daylight where you are. Um, and for me, it's a very dark and somber, moody English evening at the moment. So it's nice to see a bit of daylight, even if I'm not getting my vitamin D through a, through a screen. <laughs> ba basically, basically how you just described the environment right there in England right now, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much, <laughs> I would say, September to April. And then we have a little bit of daylight um, in June and July, and then it's, it kind of goes back to being dark and grey again. That's why all our music's so angry and uh, pissed off and scared. <laughs> I, I was going to throw happy in there, but we'll go ahead and we'll go with those. <laughs> um, so the new record's coming out in March, uh, There Goes the Neighbourhood. There's two tracks off it right now that people can check out. Obviously, Tamagotchi. Is it Gauchi? Gucci? It's that it's that old, it's that 90s toy, right? Tamagotchi, um, yeah. Tamagotchi. Tamagotchi, okay. So obviously that song's taken off. Um, because I think a lot of people it obviously refers we just talked about the 90s and and we'll we'll talk about the, the premise of the video and everything like that. But uh it and I don't want to don't please don't take this as offense because I absolutely adore this band, but Someone asked me to describe you, and I said, well, I got to give you my elevator pitch. They're Blur if they were punk rock. Yeah, yeah, we get that a lot. Like, uh, a lot of, even in the UK, people say we really remind them of Blur, which is, um, we take that as a massive compliment to begin with. Um, it's weird, because I don't. we've never, every time we hear that, we're always like, really? Um, maybe I haven't listened to enough Blur, which is weird because I saw them the other day um, in some tiny little venue, weirdly. Um, and they're amazing, but we take that as a big compliment. I think there's a lot of, you know, we use a lot of sort of uh, colloquialisms and probably have a similar sort of accent and stuff. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we definitely take that as a compliment. I'm glad when people think that. I only say it because, you, as you said, because you guys are very quintessentially English and... Mm. Uh, I always refer to the song Park Life by Blur and I'm like, everything in there is just basically kind of hits it on that, you know, that, that younger English mindset, but those are all English traditions when they talk about and, and just the way you deliver and, and everything is like, it's just one of those, you just have that thing. I mean, there's some English bands that feel very almost American if, mm -hmm. per se, but you guys obviously hold on to, to who you are and your heritage and stuff like that. And that's, that's what's so, I mean, to American audiences, that's super charming, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's like a, when, we, when we came over there, like only a few months ago, it was, it was like people said to us before, like, make sure you um, take advantage of having an English accent. And um, we definitely, we didn't need to. Everyone was just like, it was, it was like you're, you're superheroes. It was amazing. So I absolutely <laughs> love that. And um yeah, the music, like, I, I thought it could be so hit and miss. Like, I was like, people might not even get what we're saying or understand the single lyric or anything, but it was completely opposite. Everyone was, like, totally on board with it. Um, it was it was amazing. Like, so it's, it, it, I'm glad that it does translate, you know, over there. Isn't it funny, though, that we talk about that in, in the translation thing, but since the 60s, Americans have embraced English rock, whether it's the Beatles, the, you know, someone like the Kinks, who's overtly English, Mm -hmm. Or the Stones or the Who, who are kind of more of American rock kind of thing, but but it always just feels fresh when you hear someone who has a deep accent and you're like again you're throwing off these things in culture that just don't apply over here, and uh, it's funny because Americans like the Japanese are always trying to bring in Western culture with rock and billy and everything else. Americans yeah. try to bring in English culture all the time, right? Yeah, and so, that's 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 what I hoped was the case. You know, like you see yeah. bands like the Arctic Monkeys who have done like so well over there. Um, I mean, deservedly so, one of the best bands in the world. But like, it is it's it is nice. I guess even in the same way, like when I was growing up, um, the big thing was like gangster rap. Like I wasn't necessarily yeah. that into it, but we yeah. like when when I was sort of like I don't know from the age of like you know, secondary school or high school, uh, as you guys would call it. Um, that's what everyone used to listen to. So, I mean, it translates coming this way as well, for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, I, I think like we, when we started doing it, we, like you say, there are a lot of English bands that kind of sing with American accents or you could, they could be mistaken as American or, you know, this sort of 
halfway sort of thing. Um, but we we kind of made like a conscious decision that that isn't what we wanted to do. Uh, and all of our favorite bands were very like true to where they're from. Um, so we've always, that's always been like an integral part of how we've wanted to sound and who we've wanted to be. So I'm, I'm glad that comes across and I'm glad that it's, it works over there. Well, and I think too, the, the, I think all of that comes, all of what you're saying, both of you is, is really is, is right on the money, but I think there's something that maybe you both would agree. There's something about the music in that it's, it's in, again, it sounds derogatory, but it's 100% not. It's, it's, <laughs> it's supposed to come off as a compliment. Um, is that the music is very easy to listen to mm. it's very the the production it's simple is the wrong word but it's a very precise production to me mm. uh, and that's what i love about it it's really refreshing because there's space in the recordings right mm. and that leaves it wide open for you to hear the vocal hear the words articulated and even in a british accent for guys like me they come across really because of the production. There's a lot of music that's done these days. That's just, that just blasts you. Right. Yeah. It's got it, Cause it's got to one up the next song that maybe on the radio or on, or on, <laughs> or on satellite, right. It's got to be louder than the next. And the thing that I really enjoy about your music is that it seems like there's a focus on people hearing what's important. And the, mm -hmm. the, obviously for me, it always starts with a vocal and a lyric and it looks and it looks and it sounds, sorry, not looks, but it sounds like there's a lot of, effort put it in the refinement of the lyric and some of the lyrics are very playful obviously and very almost like haphazard i'm just throwing out a bunch of shit from when i was growing up and this is just like a day in the life of right yeah, yeah. but you can tell that there was refinement in there and there was a lot of thought put into it so you know so it's like it's like planned spontaneity right it's like it sounds it sounds really off the hook off the off mm -hmm. the cuff but there was a lot of work that went in you can tell there was refinement in it and there was a lot of attention paid to that so i think the I think your music coming across to American audiences that the production helps mm -hmm. there's because like there's a lot of you especially rock bands where it's like oh my god the production it's like how many things are you trying to put in this production that are just <laughs> yeah. un completely unnecessary right so yeah. so so good for you guys on make make was that how did you grow into that what where and I, well, you brought it up right about the band and what you guys listen to and you're a product of your you're obviously a product yeah. of your influences we all are right so how did how did that come we, to be? Is that a plan? Well, I think I think we we all all four of us in the band we like really like very very different music, um, but we all come together and this is kind of our sort of Venn diagram of the stuff we like sort of thing. Um, but when it comes to like the production things, that's always been I think we've always tried to the way we the way we work is we record stuff um, as demos to like quite a high standard here in Hastings. Um, and then we send them to a producer, which is Dom Crate from Nothing But Thieves. Mm -hmm. And he will then work with it and replace things that that maybe need refining. But on this on this last album, we really, I would say, other than guitars and drums, which we would re-record, like all of the extra stuff on top, all the synths and like all the backing vocals and things like little noises that we would use. We we just kept them from the demo. We didn't. We we made sure that when we did the demo, we make it good enough that when you go into the recording studio, you don't need to re-record that. It's just done, and we try and take away rather than add to it. I think when we do demos and stuff, we we kind of you throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes into the actual um, recording process and the refining side of it, then it's more a question of taking things away. Um, and stripping it back i think for me I, i'm i'm the lyricist and i'm the singer so i i like obviously for me that's important i think we're obviously a very lyric centric band um a lot of our songs are you know story based or have some sort of story with it within them um so we want that to be heard and it, yeah it's always kind of been about the the lyrics and the vocals and stuff not not to say that the the band aren't great they are they're amazing they're much better than i am but um yeah it's always that's what it's been about there's kind of always been a social message and there might not be in every single song but definitely through albums you know um and most of our songs carry like a, quite a distinct message and story so so it's it's always been a conscious decision to do that um and i guess that that kind of goes with what you're mm -hmm. saying you know of l giving it the space to breathe um so that people can hear it i'm always the one in in um 
like at gigs and things when I watch videos back, I'm always like, the vocals are too loud. I hate it. Like I hate my vocals being like that far above everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but then ev everyone always tells me that I'm wrong and that they need to be up there. So yeah. <laughs> I just, I, yeah. I'm bat battling a, a sort of like self-confidence issue with also being like, nah, just give it, give it what people need to hear it sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. did they, sorry, Justin, just no. kind of, kind of a follow up on that. So in the process of, I'm, I'm always interested in the process of the songwriting. So do you get, does, does the band guys are sending you something that's been worked on individually. So you're, you're getting like three, three different ideas of the same song or is it, or is it bounced back and forth? And then it's like presented to you with the template or the, the, the foundation for you to, to write mm. lyrics and melodies on. How does that, so it's, that it, it's, it's changed um, a lot over the last, um, like we've got two albums out. The first one we did was completely self-produced. Um, so we did it during COVID and stuff. So it's, it was an album, but it was kind of like, you know, that we our last album that came out, um, which I can't remember the name was, Here's What You Could Have Won. That was like our first proper album with a label, with everything and recording it properly with a budget. And this one that's about to come out, it's called There Goes The Neighbourhood, which is technically our third. Um, but with the first album, our debut album, it was very much me and Ben would write, I'd write a song top to bottom uh, on the guitar and then we, we'd we'd work on it together or he would write a song top to bottom and, and we'd work on it together. Um, but then with this, uh, our last album and the album that's about to come out, things changed quite a lot. I went much deeper into really being just more passionate about writing lyrics and melody um, and wanting to focus more of my time on that rather than um, I would find myself, so it would begin with the guys would get together, the other three guys, George, Ben and Eddie, um, and they would go and they would maybe record like, they just do this once a week or something, record like five riffs or like five starting points. And then they would send them to me, um, like little 30 second snippets with like bated breath. And I would always feel bad because some days I'd be like, I don't like any of these, man. Yeah. Like I'm <laughs> not vibing them. And it's, and it's horrible. You feel like a horrible person. Um, but you, you have to like, they, they understand. And I think like, they know if I'm not vibing it, then I'm not going to be able to write something over it. So that's what they would do. But that is very, very rare that they, that they would send me stuff that wasn't amazing. So normally they'd send me a few bits and I would just hear them. And the first thing that would take my attention is I would just start writing lyrics on it there and then. Um, and then I'd, I would say to Ben, like, let's let's do this song. So it would start with those guys in a room, um, just riffing out, basically. Then they'd make a small little demo. Then they'd send me five or six little snippets. I, a two or three of them might, like, really take my fancy. And I've got, like, sheets and sheets on my phone of just random lyrics, like, um, if I ever got arrested and they looked through them, they would think I was an absolute maniac um, <laughs> just from the, the amount of weird subject matters in there. Um, and then, I, yeah, whatever I'm going to take my fancy, then we would like kind of hone in on those one or two songs and do that. And then we'd repeat the process. So for every, every like, I would say one song that we end up writing, there's probably three or four riffs and starting ideas that kind of didn't make it. Um, but once we start writing a song, once we are like, okay, there's lyrics on this now, we, we always finish it and we always, it normally makes it onto the album. So it's kind of like uh, the, the vetting procedure at the beginning is quite important so that we don't waste time. Because um, once we get started on it, then we really go for it. But that's how that's how it's worked on the last two albums. They're, they've done much more of the music, sent it to me, and then, and then I'll bring, I'll start writing lyrics on it. And then I'll go in with Ben and refine all of that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back to the the, the new single. Um, obviously, you guys are reading about it. You're t kind of tackling the idea of nostalgia, and I find it. Yeah. Are you are you thirty, Jack? Jack, did you just turn thirty? I turned thirty. Yeah. Yeah. So I find it interesting, and it's something we can all talk about is the fact that the idea that time does go very swiftly, and we, I mean, even at thirty, you get nostalgic for being twenty. Right, mm -hmm. and you hit fifty, you're nostalgic for being thirty, or by God, you get to the point where you're like nostalgic for like your you know, your great 11th grade or whatever. Um, and and it, it's funny that w there's just something that triggers, like when you turn 30, or is there something going, God, time is kind of escaping me? Or 
do you mm. look at like, hey man, this is giving me my productive next decade? What do you how do you how do you approach that? Because I, I hear thirty, <laughs> you're already being nostalgic. I'm like, is he kidding me? <laughs> he, he's just beginning. Yeah, it's it's both of those things. It's um, if you know, you said, is it time slipping away, or is it like an optimistic view of um? Uh, the productive years of your life coming to fruition or beginning um, and I'd say it's both of those things like I've definitely when I was 27 I was freaking out I remember specifically 27 it was during COVID and um, you know as I'm sure a lot of you could understand or agree if, if you're working in the music industry it kind of felt like everything you'd you'd worked on for for your whole life was coming to an end and especially felt like that for me because it felt like we were just getting to the point where people started to care, people started to notice, people wanted to like actually come and see us. Um, so it, it was like a massive humbling experience. Um, and then that was when I was freaking out about turning 30. I thought I've spent my 20s doing this and it's all about to fall apart. Um, luckily, a couple of years later, everything was okay. Um, so by the time I actually got to 30, I, it's like I'd already had my freak out and I I didn't, I wasn't actually that concerned about turning 30. I think once you like, once you get to, this might just be, you know, I'm sure it changes as you get older, but when, I remember getting to 25 was like when I started to be like, I'm getting older now. Like I'm not, 25 feels like the pinnacle of your sort of like youth. And, and it's like, that's the first, 25, you can do everything. Um, but once you get to start getting 26, 27, you're like, oh, I'm now getting closer to 30 than 25. And it's it's this whole massive freak out. And I, I think 30 is a big one for a lot of people, you know, when you're exiting your, your 20s. Um, so I did start to feel quite sort of, excuse me, nostalgic um, for like, I don't know, just stupid things like school and just weird things that I swear I just I think I'm definitely the person who's like wears rose tinted glasses a lot like I don't think it was actually that that amazing at the time but I was wearing rose tinted glasses for a bit but on the other hand um I definitely have heard from most people I speak to that like your 30s are really some of your best years you know um, and what do they say? 20s for learning, 30s for earning or something like that. <laughs> something cliche and cringe. But that that's kind of the way I'm seeing it. And um, so far, being 30 has been really good. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to the next however many years. But it is, it is, it is scary, isn't it? Like just timing in general, not even as a musician, just in general is quite an insane concept. Like... It just it, each year just feels like it's speeding up and up and up, and it's uh you got to just take it take it by the horns, haven't you? Is that? Jack, I can't wait that I can't wait to have the same conversation with you when you're fifty, when you realize you, don't <laughs> it, you you stop giving a shit about most of the stuff, unless <laughs> other than the essential items to give a shit about. Yeah. All this weight, all this weight washes away from you. But I can't well, wait for that to happen. But it helped. Look, but it's <laughs> help. But it's helping you be productive right now. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's it's a kick up the ass in some ways. You're like, right, let's now's the time, sort of thing. Is it but just? You know what's? Gr yeah. Go ahead, Justin. No, I was going to say the, the good thing about where you guys are at. Third album's getting ready to drop. You mentioned that a lot of bands these days are coming out of the gate. Their first album hits, and then the pressure of a sophomore album. Holy shit! They've sold a million copies or whatever. Got a billion views, and now the pressure's there. You guys have been allowed to kind of grow into your career. Mm -hmm. And now you're hitting 30, which is a which is a pinnacle. Your third album, they never talk about your third album. That's the super important one. Yeah. That's gonna tell you where's our longevity here. Mm -hmm. And from the the from the the sound of the first two singles, Al and you guys talked about it's super and that nothing it's super digestible. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's where we are with audiences for a lot of time. They just want something easy that they can, you know what it is? It's punk you can pogo to. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. Super Super fun Friday, but it's got to, obviously the deeper message we can talk about. Mm -hmm. But on the surface, it's like, hey man, you know, Bob Marley's thing about revolution on time, but you could dance your ass off to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's we've tactically put those two uh, songs out first. I think they're probably. Do you know what? Like, I'm not just saying this. I 
I, I'm my own biggest critic by by far. And like, um, there was a lot of songs on the last album that I didn't like. There was a lot of songs on the first album that I didn't like. This album, I and it's not just a case of that. Oh, everything new is exciting, and this this new album, I love every single song so much. Um, I, I think out of the eleven songs on there, and this is going to sound really big headed, but I genuinely think that nine of them are singles single worthy I like we it was the first time album wise that we've sat down with with a label and spoken about it and normally we're kind of going okay well these are obviously the singles and oh if we had to do another song what would we do like I don't know none of them are really strong enough to be a single with this we were all just like which isn't the singles like they they it really felt like that um and that does sound really big headed, but I, I I genuinely believe that. Like I think nine of them could could have come out in any order and and been really been been done well. Um, but we did tactically put out Let's Get to Work and Tamagotchi first, because we think they are the most palatable. That being said, there is songs on this album that are more aggressive than we've ever done. There are songs on this album that are angrier than we've ever done. Um, so I know that like it's always a hard situation to try and juggle you know the fans who originally got on board with us because they like angry punk music and then fans who like the palatable sort of like pop stuff um well you know i say pop but like punk you can pogo to uh, which i love by the way um but so it's kind of a, it's a juggling act of like what do you put out when and you don't want to like you're always going to disappoint some part of the fan base you know um but all i can say to the to the people who are if, if anyone's worried that we've lost our edge or our sort of aggression, um, wait for the next one. Um, my, my observation on that, as far as the third album, Justin, I think you, you're, you, you're right on it. I think that what, how you're setting yourself, I'll just, I'll just, it's not really a question. It's just an observation. I think you're setting yourself up by the nature of how you're creating where you're where a bunch of ideas are coming to you and you're really vetting those ideas that's going to be the key to the next to the next to the next because there's a lot of bands that i feel like are just like well we have this one riff let's force it into a song let's force this thing into a song and it becomes this thing where it's like everything you write you think is great right and it's and it, it's and it's not necessarily great and that's mm. where those four unchecked egos i mean that's where it's at unless you've got freddie mercury Right, the four unchecked, yeah. e the power of four unchecked, of, of of sorry, checked egos, four people aware of their ego and understanding that it's going to take getting rid of stuff that they might love. That's mm -hmm. where the fourth, the fifth, the sixth records start to really, because there's like like Justin said, you have one record, your first record comes out. It's like, well, I'm fresh out of ideas, guys. Uh, now, yeah. now what do we do? And now you're forcing it. It's like, oh, we gotta we gotta hurry up. We gotta we, we gotta make a record. We gotta put these songs out. And I think that really tough decision vetting process of going no and listening to your mm -hmm. bandmates and listening to other people and then you've got that other layer of the record le record company going hey what about and your producer going hey what about it's like everybody listen to those people right the mm -hmm. collective part of it is is super important and that's where i think just the way things they you're where you are sonically and where you are songwriting wise i think those are the this it's a really it's a really cool step that this current step that you're on that lead to the next step to the next step. So I, I think it's, I think there's a, there's a setup here, your system here, that's really working for you. Again, yeah, an, I, I an think, observation and a comment more than. More I, than I was going to say, I said, Jack, I think it's important obviously to hang on to those fans who were there from the beginning and they're, they want your kind of hardcore punk or, you know, the kind of important punk of it. But I'll tell you what, man, I can guarantee you that those fans would be okay if they were you and you saw, 50,000 people Glastonbury dancing to your latest song. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's Because that's the aim, right? At the end of the day, you want to expand your base and bring it out. I mean, you can alienate mm. people all you want, and but that doesn't give you longevity. That means you have to take on a second or third job in order to survive. When mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? We want to focus on this. This is going to be, this is our work. This is our life's work. Yeah. And, we, and we want that base to go really wide. And at the end of the day, we are we're never writing music we don't want to write you know yeah. it's it's never it's never one of those things like i would i would never be want to be one of those bands that's like oh we need to go more pop centric or you know we need to dilute it so that we can you know become more successful like i love i love the music we write i but what we've always done and when me and ben started this band when we were a lot younger um we fell in love over bands like the libertines 
and we would love that they would have songs they would have it was almost like they had three different dnas on on the album that were kind of intertwined but there was a, a connection that kept them going and that was you know pete and carl and the voice and and the vibe but they would have songs that were really heavy and then they would have songs that were you know called sort of indie classics and then they'd have acoustic songs and i've always wanted that like i get really bored when i listen to bands albums like Royal Blood, I think they're an amazing band, but I get a bit bored when I, after four albums and every single song has the same sort of song one to 12 is is the same, uh, you know, concoction as the last one. And there's no sort of difference in in the sonics and how the song feels and where it goes. And I, I, I really appreciate bands that have multiple different things. Like another band who does it at Wolf Alice, like they've always been really good at kind of, Switching it up, you never know whether they're about to bring out like a really heavy song or an acoustic song or a ballad or a love song or a punk song. And that's what I've always really liked. Um, and at the end of the day, that's what we've always tried to do. And we just try to write whatever we want to write at that time. We never put a song out that we don't love or that we don't care about. And if you if you came on tour with us or sat in a van with us, you would hear that that's the that's what it's like on our playlists it's like one minute is like mega death and then the next minute is robbie williams mm. so it's is it that's kind of how we listen to music as well yeah good music is good music doesn't matter yeah. you, you want to be that hey my personality is not just you know this it's mm. linear it's all over the place right um back to let's get the work real quick if 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 the premier league doesn't pick that up for advertising then someone needs to be fired they already that did. Is cus- did they? Yeah. There <laughs> yeah, you go. They used right. it. But, but, little, little snippet of this. So I'm an Arsenal supporter, which is that there, that tattoo. That's an Arsenal hey, tattoo. Go Gooner, go. Yeah, we go. So, um, yeah. our, our, our biggest rivals are Tottenham or Spurs. Uh-huh. Um, absolutely despise them, hate them. Uh, worst team in the world. And shit, this so- shit, this shit, this shit, this shit. <laughs> yeah, literally. So we, um, I was getting messages going, they've just used your song on Sky Sports. And I was like, no way. And I was like, kept messaging, like people kept messaging me like, yeah, Sky Sports have just used it for the Premier League. And I was like, wicked, finally got to see it. And it's for Tottenham. And I was like, I can't <laughs> believe that that's who they've Perfect. used it for. Yeah, it was, it was funny. Hey. It was funny. And, was you still, and you still didn't tell them to stop. <laughs> no, I let them. No. Man, I let them what go. is our... What is Arsenal? What's the situation with Jesus? What's going on with he on the injury list again? What's going on with that guy? He's uh he's currently well he's about to play for Brazil against Argentina either tonight or tomorrow night. So I think right they're saying he's fit. So we'll we'll see at the weekend because he's we're back and playing against Brentford. And if he plays, he plays. But I think um I don't know he's always injured, isn't he? They're gonna go with Eddie again up front. Probably yeah. Are you yeah. are you an Arsenal fan as well? You know what? I'm a big, a big Gooner fan because I love him, but my mom's from Birmingham, so Villa is kind of in my nice. blood. So That's I, a respectful know, I, team. That's a respectful team. So I go with them, but I do follow Arsenal. I'm always in. Thierry's still the king. So Yeah, oh, always has been, always will be. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, we're back to the music now. Back so to is the music. So is, this, so is that golf? Yeah, man. Stop it. Oh, good. Stop. Stop. Good. I love the old, the old niblick. Yeah, the old yeah. niblick. Uh, hey, Jack, how did you and Ben meet? What's the what's the origin story with that? So, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you how the, the he's the odd one out. So, um, me, me, George, and Eddie all went to school with each other. Okay. Um, yeah, he. I didn't go to school with him. Um, so Ben went to a different school from us three. And he, he used to live in London and he moved down, I think, when he was like in his early teens with his family. Um, so he kind of like, I didn't really know about him. It's, this is going to sound like the most like Paul McCartney, John Lennon meeting on the top of a bus sort of thing. It is that cliche. Um, but I went to a house party when I was maybe 16, I think, 15, 16, which is like, they're always the craziest parties when you're 15, 16, because no one knows how to behave. Like no one's learned how to have a house party yet. Um, so it was one of those ones. And I remember kind of stumbling around um, and I bumped into him and he was smoking something questionable. Um, and I was like, hey. And he was like, hey. Um, so And then we started chatting. And then I remember just later on that evening seeing him playing a guitar and just 
like surrounded by girls and he was just absolutely killing it like it, it was just like something out of a film um so i met him that night and we we got on with each other um i remember he typed his name into my phone um his name's ben beatham but he was so smashed that he spelt it like completely wrong and that is still how his name is on my phone i've never changed it so it's just like a whole load of letters basically um and that's how we met. And then basically I, I decided that I wanted to put a band together. This was like a little while later. I had to do like a project at college, I guess. It, well, no, it wouldn't be college. It's just like, um, like when you're like 16 sort of thing. And I had to put together this project. And I thought, well, I know this guy and I know him, Eddie and George. Um, and that's how it started. And we didn't take it seriously or, or like, I wouldn't say that was the beginning of Kid Capici, but that's how I met Ben and me and Ben, then we fell in love with the Libertines and we just hung out a lot of a lot with each other, went to a lot of gigs with each other. And then we started writing music with each other um, just for fun. And then I would say, you know, years and years later, we, we decided to actually kind of do it properly and start a band and uh, continue like, you know, go for it properly. But that's how I met him. What was the what was the um, what was the moment where you were like, hey, we should do this? I think we wrote a song. Um, called 2019 um and it was did we write it before 2019 happened did we have the foresight to do that or did we write it at the end of 2019 <laughs> i can't remember but um we i think it was i think we wrote it just I, anyway it doesn't matter but we wrote this song called 2019 and it came out in 2019 and that was like the first song that we kind of really put effort into. And I, I would, that had like a really social commentary to it. And once we put that out and we saw the reaction to it, the biggest reaction we'd ever had, started getting played on Radio One, which was like blowing our minds. Like BBC Radio One's the, basically the biggest radio station in the UK for anyone mm -hmm. who's listening in America. Um, and it started to get some real traction and we started seeing people really like believe in it and react to it and have like a genuine, you know, reaction to it and and gigs, we started doing gigs and people started coming. So it was when that song came out. Um, and I think that was when I started to believe in like, even though when I listen to that song now, I'm like, oh, I'm not really sure about those lyrics they are a little bit, you know, cringy, but um, that's how it began. And that's when I started to believe in myself as for writing lyrics and for my style of writing lyrics and also realize how much I loved doing it. Um, so I'd say that around that time was quite an important pivotal moment for believing in it. Mm. Hey, uh, I, I noticed when I was reading stuff, reading up about the record of the new one and uh, two names dropped on my head real hard. Suggs from Madness mm. and obviously Terry Hall from the specials. Mm. And uh, obviously Terry Hall, obviously he was inspired inspiration of the record how did how in the world did you <laughs> meet with Suggs that's kind of a I mean that's old school <laughs> yeah um so oh the whole Suggs thing was amazing um and and before I say about that we we luckily I don't know if um this might be what you're referencing but we we got to support the specials um oh did you just okay before, just before Terry oh. just before he passed away yeah you know god bless his soul like he's Probably even just like his the, the way he looks and his is the way he dressed and everything like I just loved everything about him and his lyric writing and his style of lyric writing that sort of bleak English view I I love that um so we 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 got to I stood next to him whilst he was smoking a stig cigarette I got a picture of him so that was pretty good um so yeah that God bless Terry Terry soul he's a amazing guy and um we're we're worse worse place without him sadly. Um, but with Suggs, we so when when Terry Hall that's when when Terry Hall passed away actually the day that happened, um, the guys wrote a kind of a scar inspired song. Um, we've always kind of had that influence sort of intertwined mm -hmm. into to what we do. You know, we're not standing there going like, Ch -ch -ch -ch, but like it's it's <laughs> there if you listen close enough, you 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 can hear the vibes of of the specials sure. and madness and stuff. Um, so anyway, the, the day that he he left us, um, Ben and Eddie wrote this um, instrumental, which we've now made a song called Zombie Nation. Um, and we worked on it. For, I worked on the lyrics for it for ages, couldn't get it right. I think me and Ben spent like two days on it and didn't do anything. And then as I was about to leave, I came up with the, like the main idea for it. 
and then we just wrote then it all just goes comes out in one go um anyway so we finished writing that song and we were speaking to our a and r guy at the label dante and dante was like if there's anyone you could work with on this album or anyone who could feature on the album who would it be and me and ben both said suggs on that one song would be the absolute perfect scenario um and he was like cool well actually i know his management so i'll, I'll have a chat and see what we see what happens um and like six weeks go by and, and i'm like well that's obviously definitely not going to happen um and i get a phone call from dante and he was like oh yeah so um just heard back from dan uh from from Suggs's management i was like oh yeah not interested then and he was like no they love it he loves it he wants to do it they were like he hasn't featured on a song in like 20 years or something and um yeah, he'd love to do it. Oh, and he's going to ring you in five minutes. And I was just like, okay, Jesus. Um, so then I get a phone call from Suggs like five minutes later and he's like, you all right, mate? Hey, 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 how you doing? You all right? And I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, good, man. Like freaking out. And he's just like, love the song. Absolutely love it. Um, yeah, I'll come down to Hastings. I'll, I'll do it. I'll come do a verse on it. And I was like, okay, wicked. Like, do you, do you, want, to, um, do you want to write your own verse? Um, and he was just like, no, nah, like I love, he was like, love the lyrics, love everything you've done. I don't want to change it. I just want to come and do it. And he does more than just the verse in the end. We did quite a lot with him. Um, so yeah, that's how that came about. And it completely blew me away. And do you know what? He's still like, he's still, he's such a legend. He, he, he rings me once a week, like, and we chat on the phone um, and he just gives me sort of advice and stuff. And he, he's just like, if you told me this, I was going to say when I was a kid, but if you told me this a year ago, I would have lost my mind because he's such an idol and like that whole, that everything that they did, you know, and uh, for, for music is, is so massive, especially in England. So um, that whole thing has been amazing. And to, to just have Suggs' phone number on my phone um, is, is quite funny. Like he was, he did a, we got a show over here called Strictly Come Dancing. I don't know if you guys have that, um, but he performed on it the other day and I was just sending him pictures of him on the TV. Like, what are you doing on Strictly? Um, but it's just mad. It's amazing. It's just yeah. so cool. He liked this story. So I was, I live in the New Orleans in the French Quarter, and I was walking down not too long ago, walking down the street, and I walked by this little shop, and there's a picture, a framed picture of Terry Hall. I was like, a young photo, like 80, 81. Well, this guy named Steve Rapport, who was an English photographer, moved here, and he shot, he was like the specials main photographer, The Clash. Mm. And I go on there, boy, that dude has some great stories. So, yeah, if you ever make to New Orleans, you got to find that guy. He has every Terry Hall special, uh, oh, every, mate, every, sounds, every story ever. Yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I, well, we're hoping to come to New Orleans next time, so I'll make sure to do that. So let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about the idea of your band. 2024 looks like it could be something for you guys over here as far as like, you know, you're going to be obviously playing with us. That's kind of a start for like and a lot of people. I mean, they're going to get familiar, at least on our cruise with who you are. But then you're doing some of the festivals like Welcome to Rockville. So you have exposure now to 75,000 people. Mm -hmm. So is this one of those years where it's like, hey, our focus is going to be trying to do something, to make a dent in the States. How do you go about that? Yeah, the, well, the starting to make the dent actually started um, a few months ago. So we, um, you may or may not know, it, we we did like a six-week tour of America with Nothing But Thieves. Um so we, that was our first time ever going to America as a band. Mm -hmm. um, and we did the whole thing, basically, like pretty much. We did all of the East Coast. Uh, then we did the Midwest. Then we went down into Texas and we did the South. Um, we didn't do a lot of the South East. We didn't, we didn't get to do the South East, but we did the South and the Southwest and then all of California as well. Um, so we played to thousands and thousands of people and every night they were playing like sort of 4,000 people a night. And we did a couple of festivals. I think we did louder than life. Um, and okay. whatever the sister, whatever the sister festival of that is. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember now, but um, yeah, we did. We, so we, we were there for like six weeks, just absolutely smashing it every night. And um, the reaction has been unreal. And, and so, so like, yeah, we'll come back over, we'll do ship rocks and we'll do these, these festivals as well. Um, but then we will definitely be, back around that time not allowed to say too much i don't think but it's pretty obvious no. um we will be back around that time doing our own thing um and yeah i think from the reaction that we had from doing that nothing but thieves tour and those festivals i think we'll, we'll probably 
I don't know, it's hard to say, but it feels like we'll do all right. You know, when I look at socials and stuff, I, I feel like a lot of the people commenting and stuff are Americans. Um, and when you when we look at our stats and things on, on streaming, a lot of it's American now as well. Um, so I think, you know, when, when we do get the chance to come back out there next year, it will be a really interesting experience for us. Um, but definitely it felt like when we were over there that there was definitely something there. Um, it definitely felt like people were really receptive to us. Um, and a lot of the like promoters that we were working with and stuff were on our case straight away. Like we got to have you back and you know, it's like, it's probably a lot of chat and stuff, but people were, a lot of the promoters were saying like, I haven't seen a reaction to a support band like that ever. Yeah. They may not, they may not make that happen, but they don't usually just say that. Right exactly you yeah, know what so i mean it's so probably it's, somewhere in between yeah um yeah, yeah. so so honestly I, I yeah the reaction that we had from people was insane um so i i think we got a good chance of of coming back and you know hopefully being able to do something start to build something you know what i mean like start to build something over there is the aim of the game Have yeah you... it's it's really go ahead justin no, I was just going to mention this. Like this, it's almost like I would. I don't. I don't like to use the words "next wave" because it just sounds like well, it's going to come and go. But just kind of this new iteration of punk that's started kind of with Frank Carter, mm-hmm. and then it's kind of grown, and now it's like you guys, Ammo and the Snippers. You know, all these like we're importing punk again. Almost feels like yeah, you know? 100%. And, uh, and, and that's why audiences are taken to it because it's like it feels fresh again because a lot of these kids they didn't grow up with it you know mm-hmm. green day is like the, they were one when that album came out yeah now this is you belong to them now you're you're to me i, I have the damned they have you yeah right. <laughs> yeah you know? so well, I, 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 I think that's exactly what it was and that's how it felt it felt like uh, like that someone said that to me the other day like is that there's bands in the UK that are kind of like doing the Arctic Monkeys thing again. There's bands in the UK doing like the Radiohead thing again. And I'm going to like the rest of the guys in the band, like, how is this so successful? Like, it's just a rip off of the Arctic Monkeys or it's a rip off of Radiohead. And and they're going, yeah, but these kids have never, like some of them have never listened to Radiohead or never listened to the Arctic Monkeys and stuff like that. So it's all fresh. And I think for us, especially in America, it, it just feels kind of like the right time in the right place. Um which is how it, how it's felt over here as well. Like there's been such a big punk resurgence. Um, and I think in general, the feeling of uh, when we were in America is like, I think it, it feels a bit more like the general music listener in America is, is happier to listen to like heavier music. In the UK, it's, it feels a lot more like people uh, are on the other side. They, they like pop music or like sort of, drum and bass or something like that. But in America, it feels like people are much more open to guitar music still. Um, I might be wrong, but that that was how it felt to us. Like people seem to like like heavy music more than they do in the UK. So the UK is always like a tough sell, but obviously we've been working at it for a while. So we've kind of got where we want to be. But America feels like people are more receptive and happy to like it. it like, like you say, it feels like it's like almost new to them, um, that style of music, which is amazingly perfect for us timing wise anyway uh have you ever been on a cruise ship i've never been on a cruise ship no i've been on a ferry to france yeah that's, that's funny justin that but that was the same thing that uh someone told us that last week right week before last uh, i yeah, forget who I mean, it was said the same thing gentlemen uh, the guys in tiger cub yeah guys yeah in tiger, tiger yeah. so we're, like, we're good friends with, with tiger cub they live they live about 45 minutes away from us yeah we just had them Perfect. on the podcast last week they're so great and and kind yeah, of the same, the same thing with you guys it's like the cruise experience so so here's a couple guarantees i can make you you'll you've never yep. experienced anything like ship rocked um the fans that you will inevitably gain on ship rock will literally be there for the rest of your career. <laughs> You'll come back. When you come back to the States, you will have at the very least a handful of guests of our guests, your new fans that it will say, I saw you on ship rock. They'll have their ship rock <laughs> shirt. They'll have something. They'll have a video from one of your shows. There will be a ship rock conversation. You will remember some of them. You'll see them, you know, you're going to have Absolutely. having lunch somewhere at the buffet and someone's going to say, Hey, I'm going to come see you. And, it's just, it's inevitable. We hear it from our, our, our artists all the time. Um, so I just want to prepare you for this. Um, 
And, you know, usually when people say, yeah, I was on, a, I've been on a cruise ship before. We always like to say, well, you, you haven't been on this cruise. You haven't, it's nothing like that. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so what's on your mind as far as the, as far as the ship goes now that we will, we'll end this with a little ship talk here. What is, uh, what's going through y'all's mind on uh, what that experience is going to be like? Well, I'm, uh, we, you know, the Nova twins, I think they've yeah. done ship props before. Yep. So, um, we're very close with the Nova twins. Um, they live in they live in Hastings as well. Um, in fact, I mean Tiger Cub, Cassiette, uh, Yonica, us, Nova Twins, we all kind of live within a sort of hour of each other. Um, and there's that's kind of like where the punk resurgence is kind of coming from, this sort of like southeast uh England thing. So I've I've already spoken to um Nova Twins about what Ship Rock is like. <laughs> um and they they yeah they they said it's amazing they uh, they were like they said it has a, a water park or water water slides or something on the ship is yeah. that correct oh yeah so i've heard that i think it's um i mean the mad thing is like also that we're going to get to go to these to these countries that we're that we're stopping yeah. off at you know like mm -hmm. i think being in a band like that's always been our favorite thing is is traveling and getting to see the world i mean who doesn't love that so to go to the Bahamas and to go to Jamaica and stuff, that's that's going to be incredible. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's. I think I'm gonna. It's probably going to be one big blur. Um, does it get? Does it get super? Does it get super rocky? Everyone says that it's such a big ship, you don't really even feel it. You don't really feel it. I mean, we can we can experience some weather, um, and we have in the past over the years. But generally, I mean, you've got enough time to see that weather coming, right? So they yeah. can the ship can navigate kind of out of the way, steer clear or slow down or all the things that they do to make it a pretty seamless, a pretty, a pretty, uh, you know, pretty level voyage, if you will. Usually mm -hmm. on the, usually on the return, when you're coming back from on your way back to Miami on the return is when it can get the, the rockiest just because the ships are really moving fast. Like they got to go. Yeah. They're, they're hauling ass to get back. Right. And that's how fast is this? How fast do ships like that go when they're just uh, basically the speed of light. <laughs> nice yeah <laughs> straight around yeah if not the speed of light it's either the speed of sound or the speed of a cruise ship i can't i can't remember it's one of those yeah yeah it's, yeah, it's, one it's, of super, those. it's supersonic at least we know yeah that at the very That's least given. yeah yeah That's no i think i think uh i think it is um up to tw nearly 20 miles an hour wow 22 23 miles an hour speed yeah. isn't it yeah it's crazy yeah, I mean, massive for, things. A, for a vehicle that size yeah it's pretty yeah it's, it's pretty fast but do you, I, do you I think I was gonna say, Jack. I said one thing you notice is that people are up the crack of dawn and the beers and everything's flowing, and it goes. It just it's yeah twenty four seven right? international like, waters, what, man. That's right. Your, yeah. No, which no, it's like, hey, we saved up all year for this one week. We're gonna yeah. make it yeah. every yeah. second's gonna count, and it's it it's super. Like you can tell, people go really hard on that first day, and then they're regretting yeah. it. It's just like slow oh. it down, learn That's to what, control what it. That's yeah, the English right. way, anyway, as well. So I mean, yeah, yeah. we'll we'll be we'll be no different. I think we'll um we'll have to hope that we're not playing on the second day because I guarantee that first day will be uh yeah will be difficult. <laughs> it's the same with every festival. We just show up like Glastonbury and stuff, and I was like, right, we just got here. Arctic Monkeys are about to play. We're gonna we're not going. We're just gonna get to sleep. It's our de it's our Glastonbury debut tomorrow. Blah blah blah. And next thing I know, it's 4 a.m. in the morning and we're all talking about the Arctic Monkeys and what album's the best one. Um, so, yeah, but we're, 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 we're a resilient band. We're, yeah. we're good on a hangover, so we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. Yeah, it's uh, and these and these fans, uh, you'll learn, you'll you'll experience it. They're just they're uh, they're way into music, like obviously nice. right? they want to marry their party and their vacation with music. And it's like they are mm -hmm. they're into the nuance. They're into if, if you know, during your show, you're going to be doing some things that you know, that you haven't maybe haven't done before, or they're going to, they're going to really pick up. They really, they pay a very, they pay a lot of attention to all the nuance and it's, you know, the mm -hmm. venues are and a lot of the venues are small too. So it's like mm -hmm. it's a very intimate thing. And even the deck stage, the big stage is a, there's an intimacy to that. And these mm -hmm. people, these people are all in it for one another and for the music. So, well, well that's it. You know, they're yeah. there for one reason and one reason only nobody's going cause they want to go for a cruise and then they're going to be like, what's all this music about? Like it's, I think it's an amazing idea, by the way. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, yeah. I, so they're obviously going uh, for, for, for the music um so that is you know really the way we got to look at it is like each each person at this at this gig is probably worth maybe like five people do you know absolutely. what i mean because absolutely yeah, yeah that's a great way to look at it it is a great way and, to look at it and we're and, stealing and you know, we're stealing that 
Yeah, mm. and it allows yeah, you're you to, welcome. <laughs> it allows you to, since you're off doing this very special, unique, that you as a band can do things you either have done before, play songs you haven't played, or just kind of play it loose to go, hey, what mm. do you want to hear? Maybe they'll throw, like, you do a cover song you've never done. Mm. I mean, some bands dress kind of off fun. in tropical. Yeah, some of the bands dress up in tropical wear. It's just, it's just like, man, it's it's your vacation too. It's a little bit of working vacation, but yeah, treated treated as you wish. But, yeah, listen, uh, yeah. Two, two shows over six days is not is not too bad, right? There's plenty. Yeah. There should be plenty of downtime. Yeah, and- trust trust me, we're not we're not um we're not feeling like this is going to be too strenuous at all. Yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. very much right. we're very much looking forward to it. Like we 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 can't wait to do the gigs, but we're also super looking forward to just hanging out with everyone. Like we're yeah. we're a really we're a really like open band. Um, we're really we like to meet our fans and like genuinely like to have conversations. So if you're watching this and you see us, like make sure you come and say hello. We're always we're not gonna we're not gonna give you the cold shoulder or anything like that. Um, and it would be we love meeting you guys. Um, so it'd be nice to nice to see your faces when we're there. Yeah, absolutely awesome. That's great to hear. I love it. Well, let's we're gonna close with a thing that we like to call walk the plank, uh, and. You know, uh, I don't think I need to. Uh, I don't think I need to explain what it is. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and ask you. We're going to ask you some weird questions. Sure. Uh, when is the when when is the last time you cried, and why did you cry? Um, I think I cried in America when I had food poisoning, and we had to do like a nine hour drive to to um Texas, and that you can't even use the toilet on the bus. <laughs> I was expe- usually I was expecting this. Well, my grandmother. Uh, no, <laughs> no, it's like that was. Hey, listen, you got to answer it. You got to answer it honestly. What, yeah, that was what a was bad the, week. What was the food? Uh oh, it was um Asian food. I had some bad pork. Oh man, bad pork. It's listen. That's Justin's favorite meal. Bad pork. Yeah, I think it was a good band. Good, good band. Great band. Too. Great band. Yeah, good yeah, I think you guys. That was your cover band in college, right? Bad so band. I'm going to stay kind of in this lane, Jack. What, what smell? What one smell do you associate with your childhood? Oh, fried eggs. I would say because um, I grew up with my mum and dad, uh, or or like you know fried toast, anything sort of breakfasty in that regards. My mum and dad used to own like pubs and stuff. So oh, I, okay. um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to grow up in pubs, so I would say that, you know, coffee and fried eggs and stuff like that. Baked beans yeah. and tomato. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> All right. Awesome. What song evokes the strongest emotional response? Um, The Winner Takes It All by ABBA, for sure. Oh, I was, uh... It takes all, yeah. <laughs> I was... um. The only reason I say like I I could have a list of a thousand songs that make me want to cry um or or laugh or whatever, but um that's why I love music so much. But with that song, um we were listening to it on tour, and I was just like I hadn't heard it in so long, and um it just kills me when she just does that final elongated line at the mm-hmm. end of the winner takes it all. I'm just like go on girl. And it's just it's so good. So for me at the moment, that's my that's my little emotion. Maybe song. that was it. Maybe that was the second to the last time you cried. Was literally- you, yeah, 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 yeah. That might <laughs> and that might have been. I get confused. I'm always crying. I always, I, you know, Justin. I've asked that question before. What uh, and and we're getting a little. I'll get a little off base here. But what song evokes the strongest emotional response for you? For me, yeah. Give me a second. You tell yours, and I'll give me a second. Mine is "Boys of Summer," Don Henley. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good color. one. Heavy man, that's heavy, dude. I, uh, I think mine would be "Strange Magic" by ELO. Okay, nice ELO, mate. I, another one for me, if if a less of a jokey one and more of a real one, is "Shine on Your Crazy Diamond." Pink Floyd, as sure. always, sure. Absolutely. For me, what's what part though? There's like nine of them. Oh, all yeah, of true. it. You all like, of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I I remember I used to we, we when I was like younger, we had this um this weird little caravan that we would all hang out in. And and the only album we had on vinyl was uh, Wish You Were Here. And we would just listen to Wish You Were Here, flip it, wish, listen to that, flip it. Mm-hmm. And I just, I must've listened to Shine On like a thousand times in, yeah. in a decade. Like, so that's always got to have been an emotional song. Is there, this isn't even on my list, but it got me, I asked this question of a friend the other day, we were talking music and is there any music that you just don't need to listen to anymore? Is there stuff that you love? That you're just like I'm okay. I'm okay if I don't hear it. 
you know like yeah, I, I burned I, I burned out so many songs yeah and my people yeah. want to kill me when i say this but like van halen one believe it or not mm. i'm i'm totally good i listen to it so much when i hear it now it's fine that i hear it but i mm. listen to it so much that it's just like mm -hmm. it's almost like oh, okay man you really got me i, I really got you we've got each other I, yeah i run with the devil you know, I it, and it sounds great, and Eddie Van Halen. It's like it's amazing, but it's like I'm I'm just kind of good, man. Yeah, I totally. And it's not it's not that you dislike it or you know you still love it, but it's just kind of like you know, you've uh, it's 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 just you kind of it doesn't change how you feel about it. You just you, it's enough. Yeah. Um, Do you have any mu any music like that? Yeah, I think I have quite a lot of music like that. Um, but I always think there's always gonna there'll always be a time where you come back to it, and mm -hmm. I think for me. The band that, and it's not their fault; it's my fault that I've overplayed them totally, in my youth. Totally, totally. And it, it was it was the Beatles for me. Like I, every single album, top to bottom, I, I like. I grew up listening to the Beatles. My mum and dad used to love the Beatles, um, so I was like a very much a Beatles kid. Um, and it was like there's so much of it that you you always find something new. But I literally got to the point where it's like I'd listen to every album top to bottom so many times um so for them they're kind of like one of those bands that i could like name every single song and like know everything about it but i don't really listen to them anymore until that new song came out the other day what was it now and then or yeah, like that? Mm -hmm. yeah um and that kind of triggered a few things in me and i started listening to a couple of old things but they're one of the bands there's quite a few of them i'd say arctic monkeys are another one of those bands that i kind of like grew up with and like absolutely rinsed forever um, to the point where it's like I absolutely love them and I think they're amazing, but I um I don't really listen to them anymore. Right. Um. So weird, weird thing that, isn't it? Yeah. How did you like the How did you like the Beatles song? The first yeah. time I heard it, I was I was kind of a little bit indifferent, and then I watched the ten minute like documentary thing that they did about it. Um. And then then I started to. It always takes a couple of times to listen to a song. Um. But now, yeah, it feels really poignant now. Mm. Now, when you after you watch that. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's really good, and I I just think it's what a time we live in. That the, all it took was for them to have that um, digital software where they could separate the piano and the the vocals mm -hmm. to be able to do what they've done now. And I yeah, crazy. I just think it's amazing. Yeah, and I love that when they were talking about it that the Beatles in you know the sixties or the seventies were always pushing the boundaries of um, recording technologies. And the, the fact they're still doing that in 2023 yeah. is just like, it's crazy. It's so cool. It's really cool. It's crazy. Hey, one thing I wanted to close on, Jack, you mentioned documentary. Every song you guys have seems to have a video that accompanies it. What, what <laughs> yeah. was it? A, that's a great scheme because now every song, as you mentioned, every song could be a single because it has mm -hmm. now a visual application to it, which people love. Whose idea was that and how time consuming is to do that i hate doing music videos it's my least favorite thing ever you don't um, say <laughs> <laughs> it's that classic thing of like i didn't start doing music to like film and i hate i don't like being on camera i don't like having my picture taken like all of that stuff so um it's, it's not my favorite thing and i know we have a lot of them um but yeah i don't really know whose idea that was or uh, maybe the label which is weird because they're the ones paying for it so I don't know why they why they keep pushing it. Um, but no, I think we, we've we just worked with a really good director, Nick Suchak, who is, uh, he works with Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes. We met okay. him when we were on tour with them. Um, and he, he just always has great ideas. And I think because our songs are so um, like visually based and like, you know, they have such a strong like imagery and stuff, they're kind of easy to make videos for. Mm -hmm. um you can literally just copy like we work really close with him like we come up with the ideas and and work with him as well um so we sometimes we just come up with an idea and we feel like it's too good to not do and we just do it <laughs> um but never my decision I, i'm always much more happy to just um sit in my room and write lyrics basically it's funny you say that because it goes back to the beatles song for me i heard that i saw the song i saw the song right? i saw the video first as i was listening to the song and I was like, eh. and then I listened to the song on its own later mm. for the second time. And I was like, it's a great song. And the yeah. video had its own wonderful thing to it for sure. It's quirky and some of it didn't make sense, but the song to me was just, was way better than the video. Like I don't yeah. need, I don't, I personally don't need video either. Like, uh, and when we grew Justin, when we were growing up, it was like, there yeah. wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot. Like tool was tool was really the first band that was just like, we're not doing mm. that. 
We're just not. Uh, I, I, I wish we could do that. Like, right. I, I, yeah, that's probably just me being like grumpy or lazy. I don't know, but um, I, I, I never watch music videos. Like, unless someone's like, you have to watch this music video, you know. Um, I, I, I don't even know how relevant it is anymore. Like for for the sort of music we're doing, but. Anyway, apparently it is, so we have to keep doing it. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm definitely more like I, I just listen to music, you know. Um, you, you you need it for your IG algorithm. That's exactly why you need it. Other than that, you know what I mean. That's what it, that's I know. What yeah, that's what. It is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I, I, yeah. I hate all of that stuff, as you can probably tell. But um, if if the fans enjoy it, then good, good for them. It's, 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 look, <laughs> and, and the, at some point too, you can work. You you keep working really hard at it. You can you can try to distance yourself from that part of mm. it. Go, hey, you know what? Yeah. I'll show up for 45 minutes. You guys get what you need out of me. Yeah. You do it. Not you quite there yet. Yeah, I'll keep right. putting in the graph for now. But yeah, um, but yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. I understand the reasons behind it. But um, yeah, I'm a listener, definitely, rather yeah, than a viewer. For sure. Well, Jack, thank you for giving us an hour of your time. My friend, I know it's getting late there. You're probably ready for bed. <laughs> anyway, listen, uh, Kit Capici uh, going to be joining Ship Rock here in 2024. Look forward to it. There goes the neighborhood. Comes out in March on Spine Farm. So, Jack, once again, thanks, but uh, much success, and we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you in a few months. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone there. It'll be amazing. Yeah, Thank right. you, yeah, Jack. It was great, man. Thank you. Thank All you right. so Take much. Care, man.